Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, episode 31, a conversation with Rita Rudner with new music from the Upper Crust. This is the last of three episodes about this year's Women in Comedy Festival, which took place in Boston a couple of weeks ago. Episodes 28 and 29 were taped at the festival with Femity Trio, Caitlin Gill, Aaron Judge, and Caitlin Bailey of Kate Comedy, Reformed Whores, Festival founders Michelle Barbera and Elise Schurman, and of course, my late night conversation with Petey Gibson. Rudner was one of the headliners of that festival, and I spoke with her for a feature in the Boston Globe. It was a long conversation covering her 38 years in stand-up comedy, from her Broadway roots to her recent long-running stint in Vegas, and how she developed her delivery and point of view, and the show business advice she gives to her daughter, who is at the beginning of a career as a singer-songwriter. We even talked about bathroom grout, all the glamorous stuff. There was far too much to fit in the Globe feature, so I thought I'd let you all in on the conversation. It was surprising to me that I'd never interviewed Rudner before in almost 20 years of writing about comedy, and I'm delighted to have finally caught up with her. After the interview, I have a special treat for you. New music from the Upper Crust from their new album, Delusions of Grandeur. If you're a fan of hooky, meaty rock and roll, you'll want to take note. And now, Rita Rudner. Yes, it's Nick from the Boston Globe. How are you? <laughs> which I, which I'm assuming how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. And I, I'm assuming you're either in Las Vegas or or California somewhere. Yes, I'm in California right now, and um, just so you have a picture of the glamour. Um, I'm getting the grout redone in our bathroom because the floods, the water came in, and it it um, it dissolved the grout. So. It's uh, route day. Oh, great. So I'm, I'm assuming there are photographers crawling all over the place. There are photographers. I'm, I'm calling the Inquirer right now. <laughs> I had faulty grout, and now I'm going to have beautiful grout. They, they would probably... You don't want to play with your grout, because if the <laughs> water gets in, then it's no good. So you've got to regrout. I, I feel like the Inquirer would probably run that story. Okay, well, um, that's, that's about as exciting as my home life gets. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. You, you really should have a TMZ guy there. I should. You know, at one time a TMZ guy accosted me at the, uh, an airport, and I had just come from, oh, across the country, and they just get you when you're, you're so tired. And I don't know, they shouted something at me, and all I could say was, have a nice day. So I don't think that they really reported that on their show that night. Uh, they be- I, I really did look amazing, because I think I was flying all night, and I had I was dragging myself to my corner. <laughs> <laughs> the the one time I, I I I had one TMZ moment w- which kind of warmed my heart a little bit because I'm used to seeing these guys hassle people, uh-huh. but I did a story with Carl Reiner uh, where he was uh, where I was with him when he was coming out of uh, out of the back on Jimmy Kimmel there, and hey. and one of the TMZ guys called him over and, and could not have been more polite. Uh, and honored to be in his presence, and it was a that was a tribute to him, I think, to to Reiner. That, oh, that was good. Well, he got respect. <laughs> yes, which I, I wasn't. It wasn't something I was used to seeing from no, from I, those. I, I, whoever that was, I compliment him. And I don't. I don't even think the person, whoever it was, was rude. He just started shouting, "Rita, what do you <laughs> think of her? I said, Have a nice day. I'm going home." <laughs> <laughs> Have you encountered those people a lot? No, no, that's just, just you know, nobody knows. I just, when I, unless I'm wearing a gown and carrying a microphone, it's just not really something that occurs to people. Hmm. You, you see... And I don't really go around wearing a gown or carrying a microphone. Well, that that's good. That's a good strategy. So, that's good, because I save it, I save it for, the, for, for when I'm telling the joke. Every once in a while, you'll see a picture of a big star just wearing a hat and glasses and a nondescript jacket. And you'll think, well, people still know who that is, but I, I, that probably works most of the time. You know, I don't know. I've never been, I've always been at a really comfortable level of uh, where I was in, in the, the public uh, perception. 
because I know, you know, when you get really famous, I have a friend who was a big star in a TV show for a while, and he found people with those lenses looking in his, he, he rented a beautiful house in the Hollywood Hills, and he would open the windows and look out in the view, and then he started seeing pictures of himself, and they had all these long lenses, and they were taking pictures of him in his house. <laughs> so he had, he had rented this gorgeous house, and he couldn't open the, the blinds to look at the view. So... I've always been at the, the level of fame where um, people, if they, you know, I can't some, find something at the grocery store, somebody helps me. But that's about it. Uh, well, isn't that kind of a, a better level to, to be at? I, I like it. And then, you know, I do, I, I, you know, I get to do a lot of things around, like I always do lots of charity work in Las Vegas because I have a, uh, and in where I have at my beach house, because I have enough fame where I can kind of, you know, raise money for the, the causes that I like, and people are polite to me, so that's enough. Mm -hmm. And what appeals to you about doing stand-up comedy after, was it your 38 years after you started Oh now? my gosh, don't say it out loud, probably, because <laughs> it was 1980, and so yeah, 37, let's just do 37, but maybe <laughs> 38, I probably got dabbled in it a year before. Um, it's just there's nothing better than having independence mm -hmm. and because I get to say what I want to say think what I want to think do it in the places I, I want to do it and wear what I want to wear because before that I was always in show business I never knew how to do anything else and I was on you know I, I don't know if you know I was on Broadway for 10 years and I started yeah. when I was um, 16 and uh, or seven, 16 I was on the road 17 I was on Broadway and people told me I was a dancer, I was a singer, I was an actress, where to put my foot, how long to hold a note, what to say, where to stand when I was saying it. And then, when I first got on the David Letterman show, I said, oh my gosh, I'm saying things the way I want to say them and things that I thought myself, and it was so liberating. <laughs> so I think there's nothing you can compare it to being in charge of your life. Were you happy to leave Broadway behind? Yes. <laughs> I loved it, but it's kind of a, you know, I did it for 10 years, and, you know, I've been offered shows on Broadway since then, and I think, why would I want to do that? I, it, as much as I love to do it then, it would be so restricting mm -hmm. to do it now, to have to do, do it, to say exactly the same thing. I did a play last year, um, there's a theater near where we have our beach house, and I was asked to do it in London, and I didn't want to go to London, because I have a family, and... I, I didn't want to, you know, leave my daughter and my husband mm -hmm. and my dog. I want to stay here when I live with my family. So I said, uh, there's a beach house, there's a theater here, do you want to try it here? And I did a two-person play with a really uh, fine actor called Charles Shaughnessy. Mm -hmm. And um, it was fun, and we did it for six weeks. And uh, it was quite a challenge, but it was six weeks. When you, get to, when you do something on Broadway, you know, it's a year. So I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. Hmm. That, that's more of a consideration, staying home with, with the family? Yeah. Why would I? I love it. I, I said my daughter's only home for uh, three more years. And then, you know, I, I say she either goes to college or jail. I don't know which one. <laughs> but but um, I, I wouldn't want to miss her tennis matches. And, you know, she's in her music programs. And I get to do vocabulary with her at night. And that's really fun for me. Mm -hmm. And you take her on the road with you to open sometimes? I do, but only when it's spring break. And I don't, I, as much as um, she, I tell her she doesn't need to go to school, she said she'd rather stay in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to take her out of school to do any shows. But she does New Year's Eve with me, and uh, she's doing a show in Hawaii with me because I, I, I'm going to Hawaii in the summer, and um, I'm also doing a cruise in the summer, and she's doing a cruise with me and opening for me there, so whenever, oh, I also just, uh, she and her friend uh, have a, a, they do a duo, her friend who's a really great songwriter, uh, mm -hmm. singer-songwriter, Sydney Bowen, and um, in fact, I think she might have posted it on her YouTube thing, I don't know how to do it, Instagram, mm -hmm. where they opened for me in a theater in Palm Desert last weekend, it was really fun. Oh. But this next weekend, I'm in Skokie, and she can't go to Skokie. Is she going to come with you to Boston? No, she's uh, only on summer break, and spring break, and in the summer, or if it's around where we live. Mm -hmm. 
otherwise I don't I took her on a cruise with me when she was in I think the seventh grade and my husband and I uh, we got I, I worked for a real, wonderful company and they let let me choose where I want to go and she wanted to go to Bora Bora and it was in this fantasy and we went and we did um, some islands and she missed school for two weeks and I just didn't I didn't like all the catching up that she had to do and neither did she so we save it for when she's not doesn't have to um, math and, and uh, biology. What do you tell her about show business? Uh, I don't know. I, I asked her last night if she liked that I was a tiger mom, and she said no, but I think <laughs> she does. And I just tell her to work really hard at it, because nothing is easy. Nothing comes easily. Mm-hmm. And she's very, she's always been musically talented. And mm-hmm. um, she started playing the piano, and she was really good at it right away and I was the same for the guitar and uh, she's got an EP out uh, which we uh, donated to a tennis charity and anyone who downloads it to our tennis charity gets the um, the money from it mm-hmm. so I just tell her it's hard work and if she's not going to work really hard somebody else is going to work really hard and talent is only one of the um, elements that go into the performing case Mm-hmm. It's only one ingredient. You can have a lot of talent, and if you don't work really hard, it's not going to matter. So you have to just do everything you can. I tell her to take every advantage she can and uh, use it. Because even when I do it in studying, which is, though I don't want to look up a sentence and say how to use this word in a sentence, I say, are you going to get a better grade if you look the, look it up or if you wing it? Mm-hmm. Look it up! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, so, I'm tough. So I don't think you can be lazy. That's my uh, solution. Work as hard as you can. Mm-hmm. And she's just 15 now, right? 14. 14. Mm-hmm. And do you try to shield her from anything in the in show business? Are you hesitant? Um, like what? What do you mean? Well, no, no, it, it's, it can sort of take over your life a little, can't it? If you, if, uh, anything you want to do takes over your life. If you want to, you've got to dedicate your life to it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, somebody else is. That's what. Yeah. When I was doing it, I thought of nothing else, and mm-hmm. I kind of, you know, I kind of compartmentalized things because when I was single, that's all I thought about, and um, I put my career first. But then when I got married, it was a it's a dual decision, mm-hmm. and then when you have a child, it comes third, really. So you know, it depends on where you are in your life, but definitely when you're young. You have to put everything you have into what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Do you think? Yeah, I think. Well, am I, I doing it wrong? I think uh, Eddie Murphy said once. I, I, I wish I could never find the quote. I can't remember where he said it, but if you know, don't have a plan B because you'll take it. That's exactly right. I never had a plan B. I never had, knew how to do anything else. Mm-hmm. Everyone said you're going to be a comedian and you know, or dancer. You're not going to go to college. I said, well, no. Why would I want to do? I'm going to do everything I can to do what I want to do. And I'm not saying that's what she should do. I mean, I don't know that she's going to go to college or not. We're just looking at colleges now, thinking what are we, what's going to happen, just in case. And I know um, I want to keep her options open. I don't want to force her into show business, but that's kind of all she's ever known. Mm-hmm. I've been on stage since she was born, and you know she's come to my shows, and now she's just kind of a showbiz kid. Mm-hmm. Now, are you... I doesn't want to be a comedian. I'm glad she wants to be a singer-songwriter. <laughs> because um, I hate that that comparison thing when, you know, you go... I like that it's a, a different area of show business. Mm-hmm. Oh, not that there's anything uh, wrong with stand-up comedy itself. Oh, you just... I love stand-up comedy. No, I love it. It's just, I think it's an easier, an easier road to, to do something that your parents aren't doing, unless... You know, you want to take over the family business, and uh, but my dad was a lawyer. I didn't want to go into real estate law, so uh-huh. that wasn't really an option. Now, are the the things that appeal to you about doing stand up comedy now the same things that appealed to you when you started? Yes, exactly the same thing. When I think of a new joke, I get so excited. <laughs> when I think of a new way to tell a joke, I, I it, it's a thrill. So it's never people go, oh, because I played Vegas for twelve years. So while we were, my husband and I were raising our daughter because mm. we didn't have to travel any, and I just took a car to work instead of a plane, which was really good. And um, they said, 12 years, didn't you get a bit boring? I said, no, it's the opposite, because you get to try new things all the time, 
you get comfortable with who you are, you develop your character. It depends on it depends on how you use your um, the the assets that are given to you. Mm. You can waste them and, and not try. Or um, I I really really enjoyed trying a new joke, and I I loved every minute of it. Mm. You're still playing in Vegas frequently. Does that count to keep your uh, uh, the longest running solo show alive, no, or did that, that I, end? I do it like three or four times a year. I'm, I just finished a contract with the casino, and I'm negotiating a new contract. But um, I don't have a permanent showroom anymore where I did it every night because uh, now I think it's time to to start doing other things. Mm-hmm. And then I really wanted to be around 24-7 for my daughter, but now I can barely get her to stay home. Because <laughs> she has so many friends, and this, so i got to go. But I haven't seen Tyler for three days. Okay, go see Tyler. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so it's a bit different, and I have a bit more freedom, which is why I'm traveling this year a little bit more. I, I usually go away on the weekends for a night, mm-hmm. or two nights, so maybe three or four times a month, which is really fun, because I get to pick and choose the jobs I want to do. What years did that uh, did that run the your solo show your nightly solo show? I think to, well, I started going like performing a lot in, in like, two thousand, but I think two thousand and two to two, maybe two thousand to two thousand and thirteen. I don't know, somewhere around there. Two thousand one okay. to when was two years ago? Two thousand fifteen, somewhere in there. Yes, that's when I stopped doing it out every night. Okay. And it, it's frequently noted that there were very few prominent women in stand-up when you started. Was was that motivation for you? Did you want to help change that specifically? Oh, you're, you, you, you have such good intentions. That I did want to do it, but not for that reason. <laughs> not because I wanted to help anybody. <laughs> I did it because I noticed there weren't too many female comedians. And there were loads of female dancers and actresses and singers. And uh, I said, well, maybe I could be good at something where there aren't too many women in it. Because, uh, and then I tried it, and I said, you know why there are not too many women in it? It's really, really hard. Uh. So, uh, <laughs> but by that time, I was already hooked, and I loved it. So that was good. And then, I mean, the two women, it's funny, that were prominent in my, um, in, that were in my vision were Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller. Mm. And I could relate. It either, I thought they were funny, but I couldn't really relate to either one of them because they were so um, boisterous and right. outgoing. And I was a very shy, introverted person. You know, I said, don't, you don't become a dancer because you're verbal. So <laughs> I said, you know, I'm going to have to look at comedians who are kind of quiet. And that's why I looked at Woody Allen and um, Jack Benny, is who I modeled myself after when I was starting. But then I got to know Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller later on, you know, when I was a comedian, and they were such nice women, and they were so bright, and they had so much energy, and they were so diversified, they could do so many different things. Well, I really did admire them. But as far as me modeling myself after uh, a comedian, it was more Jack Benny. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. where your delivery sort of came from? It's a very particular delivery. Yeah, it was kind of, because I'm kind of a... I was I was a, a shy Jewish girl, <laughs> so they were the they were the closest I could find to shy Jewish women. Did did you start off with the, that delivery, or did you try other I things? The way I talk, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not really a delivery, right? It's just the way I talk, but I just I consciously didn't want to talk like a comedian. Mm-hmm. I consciously didn't want to go, you know, like that. I just didn't want to do that. Did you see a lot of things in other comedians you wanted to avoid? I saw things to avoid, and I saw things that I greatly admired, yeah. Mm-hmm. How you learn what you want to do. So I sat in comedy clubs year after year. In fact, I was, I'm writing my autobiography now, and I'm going all through all those years that I sat in comedy clubs listening to different people and you know the things that I learned and absorbed. Well, uh, I, was, I was trying to figure out who I was and what I was doing and why I would be funny. So... Mm-hmm. You know, they were wonderful joke writers. My favorite joke writer was a man named Ronnie Shake. And um, I learned a lot from watching his stand-up act. And uh, also I love, you know, existential humor. I, when Gilbert Gottfried would get on late at night, he was hysterical. And so I, you, when you, you look at things, then you go, I like this, I don't like that. That's the way you, you form what you want to do and what you want to be. Hmm. 
Well, what did you learn from Joan Rivers and Phyllis Div- Diller? Well, I learned from Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller to be uh, to try to be fearless, and that's something that I've always struggled with because um, I'm always somebody who relies on the, the the word rather than the attitude. So I, I try to have a bit more attitude, and um, I try to be a little bit freer in what I'm doing. Every year, that's kind of my my goal is to, to try to be a bit more organic in what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And also, I just like that they didn't, I love that Joan Rivers did, um, did wrote books and, mm-hmm. you know, sold jewelry. And I love that Phyllis Diller was a chef and a concert pianist. And so I try, you know, to diversify. That's why I've tried, my husband and I write screenplays together and we write novels together. I've written, you know, my stand my stand up I write by myself and my essay books I write by myself. Mm-hmm. But I've also, you know, I like to you know, I do I do a play. I did a play I told yeah. I just told you this, right? The play? Yeah. Yeah. So I do I did that and then um, I just try to expand. That's what I admired so much about them. They were never satisfied with one thing. Mm-hmm. Trying to improve. I remember interviewing Joan Rivers in 2002 or 2003, and I rolled out of bed around 8.30 for a 9 o'clock call, and I was just sort of dead on my feet. I worked from home. So I called, and she was already on the treadmill. She was in her 70s at that point. Oh, and I know. It's amazing. I did her radio show in the morning in New York, and it was an 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting there. I'm in my sweat clothes with no makeup on, standing outside the, the door, and she comes and she's she's got a she's got a um a brooch. She's already wearing a brooch. She's got a jacket and a brooch, and her hair is perfect, and she's in high heels, and she has the keys, and she's opening up the facility, and she's setting things up. And goes, Joan, how do you do this? <laughs> it's eight o'clock in the morning. Well, she, I'm she 40. did. She did. 90. <laughs> I mean, not 90, but you know what I mean. She was amazing. Well, she did that whole interview. It was, I think, around 35, 40 minutes. She was still on the treadmill when we got off. Oh, my gosh. And I. I remember I, I was um, doing something in, uh, in New York, and uh, she was doing something in New York, and then I had to fly to London. And I got to London, and I'm all jet lagged. And I turn on the television in my hotel, and she's already on QVC in England. I said, "Did she get there? <laughs> How's she doing this?" So I certainly admire her energy. Uh-huh. Now, are are you going to do uh, more after Molly goes to college? Do you think you'll do more plays and and travel more? You know, I think so. I don't know. I'm looking. I would like to. Um, tour with my autobiography. That's something I'd like to do and do stand up around because I, I really like, um, you know, I, I like talking to people and, and going. I loved when I did my book tour, especially in Boston. Mm-hmm. Boston is the best place to do a book tour because you've got really good, great bookstores. Do you still have great bookstores there? We, we've lost a few, but we still have some good ones. Yeah, because every place I go, they're just leaving. And I just used to love doing those things, you know, those those readings and bookstores and meeting all meeting people and yeah I don't know I just I hope that bookstores somehow survive well we still got Brookline Booksmith and they have a a, a relationship with the Coolidge Corner the movie theater across the street so they do a lot of bigger uh, book events where they can actually oh, well, that, I'm hoping to do that and I love going through old bookstores and finding I was in um, Seattle once doing a book tour that's another good book uh Book City, and I was looking through all these old books, and I found uh, a book of Bob Hope and Bing Crosby movies that was signed by Bob Hope, and I gave it to my husband for his birthday, and it was so good. So I love looking through this. Ah, uh, there's there's still a, a good uh, secondhand bookshop, the the Brattle Bookshop downtown. Oh well, it's... I'll see if I can make it there, but I know I'll make it there when I do my um, my tour. But I I'm I'm trying to do it later when I'm. Get it done and, and go on my 65 when I'm 65. Mm. Well, it's not too far from the Wilbur, so if you're here early. And I'm not too far from 65, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Now, are you happy to go back over your past to write a, an autobiography? Yeah, and it's good because I've had such an interesting time, and there there are lots of things that I've never mentioned that because I don't tweet them, and I don't <laughs> want to, to. I've never told everything that's happened to me in my life to the world, and it's never been in any magazines or any because uh, it's never been that it's never been very you know. Well, never been scandalous at all, but, uh, but things have happened that I haven't said, so I'm looking forward to writing them all down. And it is an autobiography as opposed to a, a memoir? Um, well, it's got memoir elements in it, but... Hmm. Well, I find people are making uh, uh, more of a difference nowadays. I just uh, interviewed Michael Nesmith about his book, and he, he called it more of a, of a memoir because he he didn't, it wasn't sequential. It didn't say, you know, I started out here as a child. It was sort of more... No, mine is an autobiography. Okay. How, how do you confirm your memories? How do you trust your memories when you're going back over this, this sort of thing? Oh, well, I lived it. <laughs> right. I didn't, I don't need... Um, uh, a witness. <laughs> right. I was there. I, I, I went through it. I, I got it. I got it all. It's all in my head. Uh huh. I mean, do you have that type of memory that you, you just sort of you remember? Well, I have to look up years and things. Like I'm sitting there and I go, "When was my first year on the Tonight Show?" But you just Google yourself and then you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> I Google myself and I say, "Oh, that's the year I did this." Has anything surprised you uh, about your your career, your life, looking back over it for the this project? Well, everything surprised me because I never thought I'd be a, I only thought I would ever be a dancer. Um, I never thought I'd be a comedian. I never thought I'd uh, marry somebody who lived in Australia. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I never thought I'd adopt the most fabulous child in the world. And I never thought I'd have a beach house. So everything surprises me. Mm-hmm. And what was your reaction when the Women in Comedy Festival told you they were giving you the their Excellence in Comedy Award? Well, I'm always very, very excited when anyone says that, that uh, they like anything I do, because um, people in show business are, are generally very needy. <laughs> uh-huh. But it's, it just is a, it's a big compliment, because people don't, you know, when the internet and everything can be so negative these days, and, you know, because people are so anonymous and they feel they can write everything and do anything they want to do and say anything they want to say. So when somebody wants to to, um, to say something that's complimentary, it's just uh, a breath of fresh air these days. I mean, my husband got so angry because I was, um, even in England, I was doing a show on television in England a couple of years ago. And um, it went, went very well and everybody liked it. And one of the, somebody commented on, I don't, I don't look at it because I don't want to be upset, but he looks at things. Mm-hmm. And Rita Rogers has so much Botox, she can hardly move her face, and the plastic surgery has gone wrong. And, just, and it was, you know, nothing about it was true. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't had Botox, I hadn't, hadn't had plastic surgery, I was just me, I was just talking. And he got so upset that he answered them and said, and you think that you're just talking about somebody... Um, who's a non-existent, who doesn't really exist, and how can you write these things when you know nothing? And they actually wrote back and apologized and said, I was just trying to be funny. Hmm. Now, so, you know, these people who write things, they just don't think about them. And I said to Martin, I said, why are you even bothering? Who cares? And he said, I care. I don't like people writing things like that about you. And it was interesting that after he challenged this person, she actually said, I'm sorry, I was just trying to be funny and say something like that. Mm-hmm. And she didn't realize that I could be a real person. But I think it's just better to stay away and not to look. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the uh, the Women in Comedy Festival? Do you know much about it? I don't know anything about it, but I'm looking forward to it. I guess there are lots of women and they're really funny. Yes, it's, it's I think, nine years old now. that uh, They skipped last year and they've been sort of ramping things up. Uh, and they're, 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 they're the Women in Comedy Festival, but there are also many men on the bills. Uh, throughout the various shows, they've been celebrating. Oh, I hope they're wearing dresses. <laughs> yes, I think that there might have been a show like that. Okay, uh, well, I like that too. Uh, early on, uh, what, what do you I'm think? Looking of, forward to it. I can't wait. What do you think of of the idea of it of, of uh, celebrating women in comedy? Why not? 
Mm. We're, I think we you should celebrate women in every area that they could possibly be, and I think we're wonderful. And um, I think we should celebrate women lawyers and women doctors and women everything. Mm. Some of those festivals. And it isn't that long ago when you know when we couldn't even vote, so we're still struggling here. I tell my daughter, you don't even know, you don't even know what we went through. Uh-huh. <laughs> you tell her all the things that happened, and then women still aren't paid as much as men, and we're still fighting for equality. Hmm. Do you feel that's that's true in comedy as well these days? You know, I don't think so. I think it depends on the audience you draw. I think um, probably. Uh, Amy Schumer is making mu- as much as any man because she can. She's, she's got a lot of visibility and can draw huge crowds. So I think it basically is is dependent on. Um, that's what's so good about comedy. It depends. It depends on how many people come see you. So it's very fair. Mm-hmm. And you think the, the was there a time when you felt like it wasn't? Um. Well, it's interesting because in my my the autobiography, I was just writing about being. I just did um, Women of the Night with Paula Poundstone and Judy Tenuta and Ellen DeGeneres, the four of us were Women of the Night. Mm-hmm. And I just I realized that I never really had uh, formed uh, firm friendships with any other women in comedy, except when I first started. One of my very best friends was uh, a comedy writer called Marjorie Gross. And Mm-hmm. We're together all the time and wrote lots of things together. But uh, a, a lot of it is because women are never hired together. Right. So you still can't, whenever I was on the road or whenever I was billed with anyone, it was always either me and a man or me and two men. So I formed much better friendships with men because I never really was um, put in a situation where I spent any, t- any time with another female comedian. So I hope that's changed. Right. Oh, and when they do put women together, they call it. Women of the Night, which I know Paula Poundstone was not terribly happy about oh, the name. Oh, I know, and then the next uh, my, one I did was One Night Stand, and I said, and the next one, uh, that's what it was <laughs> my opening joke, the next uh, title of an HBO special is going to be Sluts Tell Jokes. Oh. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that women, we still need to, um, as, as it's being proven with uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh-huh. <laughs> we still have a ways to go in getting to where we want to go, uh, in ways that are acceptable. Mm-hmm. And how has the industry changed since you started, do you think? There's so many more elements now, it seems, to deal with. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to tell anyone to start now because it's very, you know, YouTube and Instagram and um, Snapchat and all these things that I don't, I really don't understand. So I think it's, a, it's certainly a different universe. But it's also a universe where funny women are much more accepted now. And I was just, um, talking to somebody and, and thinking about how, you know, real women are now featured in movies, which never happened when I was starting in comedy. The, the funny women were always um, Daryl Hannah and um, Michelle Pfeiffer, the brand new comedian, Kim Basinger, you know, they were all very beautiful women. And it's not, it's now with Amy Poehler and Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig and Tina Fey, they're all, we're, we're actually real people. And real people, real women are allowed to be really funny in movies, mm-hmm. which I think is a huge step. Well, where do you make that distinction between uh, real and, and some other well, standard? These are women who come from comedy backgrounds instead of modeling backgrounds. Right. Or beauty pageant backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And when was the, uh, I forgot to ask a little while back, when was the last time you played Boston? Um, last year, I think, I was at the Wilbur. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I feel like it, it had been a while before maybe last year that, that you'd played here. I can't remember, though. Yeah, before last year, it had been a while, because I wasn't traveling. I didn't right. travel for a long time. Right. So, I've, I've been doing this for a while. I think this is the first time we're actually speaking. So I've, yeah, I, I've been yes, it is. I've been covering comedy here since since 1999 so it's it's always good to to speak with somebody that that you haven't spoken with well that's because i made that conscious decision not to travel for you know 12 13 years while my daughter was growing up mm-hmm. and that, and now i just now i do so now i can talk to you and now we can have a good time la 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 <laughs> 
Do you know uh, Jackie Cation, the uh, comedian Jackie Cation? No. She said something interesting on her new album, uh, which she taped after the election. Uh, she said, uh, I'm not really a political comedian, but I guess I am now because I'm human. Uh, meaning that, that she cared about everything that, that happened in the election, so she wound up, she felt she had to uh, to address that. And she changed a lot of her... Uh, her material for that based on what happened in the election. Do you, do you feel that at all? I know you're not a, a political comedian, but do you ever get tugged in that direction by current events? Mm, um, uh, well, you know what happened? I, I became a much more political person in my personal life. Mm -hmm. So I kind of save it for my personal life because uh, it's very, very jarring for me as a comedian to throw away everything I've done, which is kind of relationship driven mm -hmm. and uh, but it but it is you can't ignore it I mean I didn't know what a FISA warrant was before a week ago and uh, I I, rep I don't uh, repeal a joke in my act till I find a joke to replace it but um, <laughs> it, uh, it, even though I have really really firm opinions unless when and questions and answers that somebody asks me at the end of uh, my act a political question, I certainly will answer it, and I certainly have something funny to say about it, but I don't include it in my actual act. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just people get so angry now. I mean, you used to be able to discuss it, and now people's, people's heads explode. And I, I'm afraid because I have people I like in my life, and I just don't want to know what they think because I know I'll never speak to them again if they tell me something that uh, I, I, I disagree with violently. So... It's a tricky time now, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're the two sides of it. I, I mean, uh, Cation obviously felt very passionate, and, and she talks about her own own life most of the time and felt she needed to address politics, Not maybe not for the first time, but she's just she's not a political comedian, but she felt she needed to address it. On the other side, uh, I, I spoke with Ron White, and he said he's just going to avoid it altogether because he'd rather his aim... It is to slay you to to he said if the if the audience is is crumpled up because they're hurting from laughing so much they're not going to notice you didn't talk about politics uh, and you're not going to well, lose somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. somebody asks me i tell it and i have jokes about it and if nobody mentions it i don't mention it mm -hmm. do you watch a lot of or listen to a lot of stand up comedy these days never mhm mm doctor and you've been a doctor for 30 years you go home and watch operations <laughs> right so, <laughs> no. i love i love comedy shows you know i mean i like uh i love shit's creek that's my new favorite comedy i love Catherine o'hara and uh but no i i'm i like to avoid i like to watch tennis mm -hmm. and um actually politics now because again in my personal life i get more involved mm -hmm. I, I hear that frequently from comedians sometimes it's that they don't they're just not interested in, in watching stand-up because they've seen too much of it sometimes they they don't want it they don't want somebody else's stand-up in their head when they go to write is they, they... Well, stand-up i did watch recently i'm going to take that back who i really think was really funny dana carvey mm -hmm. i watched some of his new special on netflix and i love him i think he's really funny so i did watch i i turned that on and i watched the whole thing and i thought he was do, do you know him? Like I, uh, I've met him, yeah, and I do like Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. I love the way he's um, very, very natural and organic, and I think he's he's really talented. Mm -hmm. But it's not a it's not your go to. No, I just if I see it and I say, oh that's good, and then I watch it. Mm hmm. And is there anything else you're writing be, beside your own stand up in the the memoir? or the autobiography that you'd want to well, mention? Um, I wrote a book with my husband called Turning the Tables, and my husband has transformed it into a mini-series, which is called Heaven, Nevada, which has been optioned by a production company, and they're in casting now before they go um, shop it around, to because there's so many places doing limited series now, mm -hmm. like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, so that's something that I'll be involved with, even though I'm, I, I'm doing the voiceover. I'm not actually in it. Mm -hmm. So that's the project we have. Is that something you'd want to do more of? That there's more at seeing how there's oh, more opportunity also, now. Martin and I love to write together, so we have a new idea of something we want to write together, and we we just sit at 
um, writing it is the fun bit. Um, selling it is the hard bit. But uh, but this this seems to have gotten off the ground. And um, and then the next thing, you know, we just keep doing things that we enjoy, which is good. When when you've worked for since you were 16, which I've done, and uh, I've I've been uh, judicious with my uh, spending. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm okay financially. You can. I'm. I'm glad I get to do what I want to do. Hmm. Do you still remember uh, any of your uh, your dancing from Broadway? Oh, I, m- I remember every single bit of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was there. Uh-huh. I still have all my friends in New York. We did it together. Oh, I mean, can could you still do the the dancing? Could you still do the moves? Yeah. <laughs> so will, will we see you back dancing on Broadway? Never. So we... <laughs> I used to be really good. I would be horrible now. Uh, <laughs> I only want to do things that I might be good at. And is there anything else that, that I haven't asked about that you... Uh... No, you've been so thorough. It's very, you're very good. I'm looking forward to coming to Boston. It's one of my very, very favorite places. Well, uh, I, I told my mother I was interviewing you uh, just before I, I dialed the phone, and she said to say hello, so I would be remiss if I you did not do that. You a very big hello, and you bring her to the show, too. I want to say hello to her. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. Okay, you too. A hair to the hair isn't always a trick. Thanks again to Rita Rudner for the interview and to the Women in Comedy Festival for bringing so many talented people to Boston. You can keep up to date on Rudner at RitaRudner.com and find out what's going on with the Women in Comedy Festival at WICF.com. And now, a track from future Department of Tangents podcast guests, The Upper Crust. This is Little Castrato, a hard-rocking Johnny B. Good-like tale about... Well, let's say a man with a very high singing voice. You might be familiar with the term castrato if you're an opera fan. It refers to a male singer who has been castrated before puberty to make sure his voice box never matures, so he can preserve his higher voice and sing in a soprano's range. The process was outlawed in Italy in the 19th century, but that's more than a century after the members of Upper Crust say they first got together. More on that in the podcast next week when I talk with them. If you enjoy the Department of Tangents podcast, you can subscribe and review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also visit the blog at departmentoftangents.com. And now, The Upper Crust.
Dear Young.